seat and welcome. It is a Sunday, and so if you're here, maybe you have a habit of on a Sunday morning waking up, making a decision that says, I'm going to go and gather with my friends. In Proverbs, one of my favorite Proverbs says, There is a friend that is closer than a brother, a friend that is closer than a sister. I love that proverb because that means that we can have relationships in life that lead to those closest relationships that God gives us of a family. So if you're here this morning, I pray that you're here with your brothers and your sisters, those whom you know and love and appreciate and understand. And if you're newer to the community, maybe you don't have those types of relationships yet, this is an invitation Stick around, listen, share, invest, spend time, and watch what God will do. This is in particular a a really great Sunday because we're having a potluck afterwards. So if you walked in, maybe you saw some crock pots and started smelling some food, and as the service progresses, we're all going to get more and more hungry. And so after the service, and here's where I take pastoral leeway, you're supposed to bring something if you want to stay for the potluck, but I don't care. I'll eat less. I'll try to have my family eat less, though that might not work so well. But we want everyone, everyone to stay and enjoy God's goodness and God's grace. And that's why we're here, because we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded daily, and we need to be reminded corporately on a regular basis as well, that God is indeed a God of love and of grace. Not a God of guilt or condemnation or of punishment or of anger. And we're in a series on judges where there seems to be a lot of anger and punishment. But when we understand what God is doing throughout redemptive history, it shines a light on the truth that God is indeed a God of grace, of love, of peace, and of comfort. And so we've gathered here today to receive those things. Can I ask you to stand, and we're going to open with a word of prayer. Hey, God, we're glad to be here. We're glad that you're our Father, that we are your children. And as your children, we are called and invited to be brothers and sisters. Lord, may we just meditate and reflect on that fact that you have given to us not only a biological family, but a spiritual family. And we thank you, Lord, for this spiritual family of Rehoboth. We pray that you will continue to watch over her, guide her, and lead her by your Holy Spirit, that you will strengthen and encourage her, that you will discipline her in areas where that is necessary, and that you will inspire and challenge us, Lord, to continue to live the lives that you have called us and enabled us to live because of your Holy Spirit And because of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we open ourselves. We open ourselves wide. We open our hearts. We open our minds. And we open our entire lives to what it is that you would want to say to us this morning. And so, God, we give you praise and thanks. Amen. Well, stay with the fist bumps, turn to those around you, tell them it's great to see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why don't you uh, sit over there, okay? Because I would just want to sit here with the David Douglas. We'll sit here with you. Good morning, thanks to you. Good morning. Awesome. So you can eat awesome. more. All right. <laughs> hmm? Why did you lose it? Um, because Douglas is sitting here. <laughs> Good morning. Our call to worship comes from First Chronicles 16, verses 23 to 25. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, 
his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord, the most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. this morning comes from our world belongs to God. In the beginning of human history, our first parents walked with God, but rather than living by the creator's word of life, they listened to the serpent's lie and fell into sin. In their rebellion, they tried to be like God. As sinners, Adam and Eve feared the nearness of God and hid. Fallen in that first sin, we prove each day that apart from grace, we are guilty sinners. We fail to thank God, we break God's laws, we ignore our tasks, looking for a life without God, 
we find death. Grasping for freedom outside the law, we trap ourselves in Satan's snares. Pursuing pleasure, we lose the gift of joy. Join us in singing, God be merciful to me. is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life.
it's time for our offering this morning, which is for the uh, church's general fund, and our deacon offering today is for the local Christian school tuition assistance fund. Next, next Sunday, our deacon offering will be for the cadets, and that reminds me it's also Cadet Sunday next, next week as well. Uh, let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, and we ask you to give us cheerful hearts in all our giving. Will you bless the funds collected for the local Christian school assistance fund, and will you help it be a blessing to those families who struggle with tuition requirements? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's a time as a family we get to communicate, communicate with each other and communicate with God. So we send out a weekly newsletter that gives you a reminder about what things are happening within the lives of the members of the church. Present, we have uh, three members in the hospital, all because of falls. Uh, I just was shown this morning that a fourth member of our family was also in the hospital this week, and he's got three staples in his head to prove it. So Lawrence officially did lose the fight between he and a concrete wall, but he is uh, glad to be here nonetheless. And so we want to continue to pray for our members of our family. Let's pray. Lord, we have many things to be grateful for. We celebrated birthdays and anniversaries, milestones, new jobs, new blessings, all that come from your hand. And we give you thanks. We need to be reminded daily that everything comes from your fatherly hand. Nothing happens by chance or by fate, but all is from you. And we wrestle with that when the things that are happening in our lives are not that which we would wish, are not things that we can celebrate or enjoy, but they're things that we cry and wrestle with. There are many among us, Lord, that are rock crying and wrestling. And yet, amazingly, your word says that your grace is sufficient even in those places and in those times. And so, Lord, we come together as a family and we're simply asking you to continue to shower your grace, 
your mercy, your peace, your understanding, and your joy into the lives of those in our family who are hurting or broken. We've done this before, and I just feel led to do that again. So if there are names of people that at this point you would ask God to shower his grace and his mercy upon, will you simply call them out by name loudly and clearly? And so, Lord, hear our prayers. Spirit is laying someone on your mind. Just say their name out loud. Lori. Thank you, God. This is a congregational prayer. It's the prayers of the people that you've laid upon our hearts and our minds that so many that we care for, that we love. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us alone in isolation and you don't leave us without hope. And so, just as surely as we are here and just as surely as those names have been both spoken and thought, we know that you indeed are faithful. We've sung about it. We've declared it. And so, Lord, we thank you that you continue to fill your people with grace. You continue to watch over them. And so, Lord, as we continue... In in declaring before you through song your greatness, continue hearing our prayer and our declaration. Everything comes from you.
Thank you. Thank you, team, for leading us this morning. It indeed is a, a beautiful thing to hear uh, our voices join together. It's one of my favorite things about church. Uh, I don't really like the preaching at this church that much, <laughs> but I love it when God's people embrace and engage in worship. And one of the values we have about worship in our congregation is just diversity. I love being part of a church family where we can have services that Sunday to Sunday feel very different. And sometimes it can feel a little, you know, discombobulating or especially for people who are new. It's like, well, what is this church like? And how would you describe worship at this church? And, and, and I love the fact that our value is that we're diverse because God has indeed created us diverse. And there are a lot of different styles of music and songs that we love and we appreciate. But when we together recognize and say, you know what, it's not about whether I like this song or not. It's about the fact that this song lays out the truths about God's goodness. And I am here to celebrate that. And so I pray and I invite all of you, no matter whether you think you can sing or whether you think you're tone deaf or whatever it is, that we sing and raise our voices together. And you've done a wonderful job, team, of leading us this morning. Let's give them just a thanks. Thanks to God for what they are doing. So we are in a series on the book of Judges. And just kind of give you a layout of where, we've, where we're at. Uh, the book of Judges has 12 judges. And we're not going to be talking or covering all of them. We started with kind of having an overview of saying, here's what's going on in the book of Judges. And, and we talked about the fact that there's a cycle that's happening in the book of Judges. And so we have uh, the people disobeying God, people rebel, and we see that God is angry. And because God in his angry, he, he does, it's not that he wants to punish and that he's spiteful and hateful. He, he punishes the people so that they'll be drawn to call out to him and to recognize his goodness. So God is angry. No, stay on that first one, actually, because this one's different. Go back to your previous slide. Yeah, stay there. Uh, God is angry. Then there's an oppression by enemies. The people cry out. They say, God, come and help us. Uh, then God sends a chosen judge. So we looked at the story of Deborah, and next week we're going to look at the story of Samson, and in two weeks we're going to look at the story of Gideon. Uh, Matt Zantin is going to be preaching on that, and then today we're going to be looking at the story of a guy named Jephthah. But the, so God sends a judge, then there's a period of peace, and then the judge dies, and slowly the people become disobedient. And we see this cycle happening over and over in the book of Judges. And if we're truthful, we can recognize that pattern happening within our own lives as well. But what has happened in the story that we're looking at today is that it's deteriorating. Things are getting worse. And the people are having longer periods of rebellion. And in fact, God is getting more and more dismayed with his people. And so in the story we're looking at today is it's the people rebel and God is not just angry, but God, uh, God is very angry. And then we can go, yeah, go to the next one now. People rebel. God is angry. And then not just God says oppression, but we're going to read in a moment. God shatters his people and crushes his people by enemies. There's an escalation that's happening. Then the people cry out. And in this story of Judges... 10 that we're going to be looking at, the people cry out and God says, you know, you're not crying out because you're really sorry. You're just crying out because you don't like the situation you're in. And that's why I've entitled this, the message this morning, one of the things we're going to look at is the difference between regret and repentance. And so God says, you're not crying out because you're truly repentant. You're just crying out because you want me to come like one of your other made-to-order gods and fix your situation." And so God says, no. Then the people cry out and they say, God, we are truly sorry. We repent. Whether you fix our situation or not, we want to serve you. And so then God, at this point though, this, the, the narrative and the cycle breaks down in this story. God doesn't actually send a judge. The people appoint a judge. 
and the people appoint this judge and, and he gets them free, but then it's not followed by a period of peace anymore either. It's followed by an ongoing conflict that bothers the people during the reign. So we got a lot to cover today. So I hope you're comfortable. Get braced. I'm going to try to move through it. I tried to look at this message and say, okay, I got to get rid of a part of it. And I couldn't do it. So maybe I will halfway through, but just get ready. Are you ready? Yeah. You're ready? Okay, good. Because you know, sometimes I preach shorter sermons. Sometimes I preach longer ones. Now, I have a fancy new red clock up there, and it tells me when to stop. And Dave Reinsman, the chair of council, actually has a button, and it starts flashing. That part's not true. All right. Let's read this. So I've set it up for you, so I want you, I'll point it out as we go through. And it'll be on the screen. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now listen to this. It wasn't that they served one God anymore. They served Baals and the Asherahs, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. All the gods around them, they're worshiping. And then listen to this. And the gods of the Philistines, and because the Israelites forsook the Lord, and no longer served him. So see what's happening here is that in the past it was that they were worshiping God, but they wanted something else along with God. So let's worship God and let's worship the Asherahs. Or let's worship God and let's worship the Baals. And now they've declined in such a way that they're not even any longer worshiping the Lord. He became angry with them, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Israel was in great distress. Then here's this first cry out. The Israelites cried out, we have sinned against you, forsaking our gods and serving the Baals. And then God goes back and he says, look, you serve the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, the Mayanites, oppress you, and you cried for me to help. Did I not save you for your, from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. God's saying, I'm not like these other gods. I'm not a made-to-order God that you think you can just call me up and say, okay, help us out now. God's saying, that's not the way it works with me. You need to come before me. You need to be repentant. The Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. And then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. See, not only did it come to the point of saying, okay, Whatever you're going to do with us, we'll accept it. We understand. We hope and we pray that you'll come and rescue us. But regardless of what happens, regardless of what we feel or see or experience, we're going to be obedient to you. We're going to follow you. We're going to get rid of the other gods in our lives. What a great testimony. And what does it say? He could bear their misery no longer. Now, for ourselves... The difference with regret. You see, when we regret something, we regret really the consequences that it's brought upon us. When we say, God, we're sorry that we did this and yet we plan and know that we're going to do it again. We're sorry about those consequences, but we're stuck in believing a lie. And we're not, not always willing to take the steps necessary to eliminate whatever that idol is in our life completely from our life. And so we hang on to it, and it's, we want to hang on to God, and we want to hang on to God a little bit more, but we're still going to hang on to whatever that idol is. And so this morning, one of the questions I, I really wanted to ask is, and, and as I thought about this message, is do you ever struggle with wondering if you're really following God or whether you've compromised too much and tricked yourself? I'm going to have an answer for you at the end of this message, Right? But just think about that question. That's a question I want to put before us this morning. Is, you know, do, we, do you really feel like you're following God or do you feel like maybe you've just compromised so much in, in different areas and that we've really just lost perspective? 
Where are we? If we were to write ourselves into the book of Judges, would we be in the early stages where we were just kind of serving one God and when God called us to repentance, we realized it and we abandoned those foreign gods, those idols, whatever they are, and we turned and completely followed God? Or would we find ourselves more in the narrative that we're looking at today? We're saying, you know what? We want to follow God, but we've gotten really confused. So I want to follow through and understand that for us this morning. Romans 12, Romans 1, excuse me, says it this way, verses 23 to 25. It's a parallel passage to what's happening in the book of Judges. And here Paul says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal gods for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. I love that. I love that text. I think that says it so well. Is that so often we so easily find ourselves following into that trap of worshiping created things, thinking that they will bring us the satisfaction and the joy and the peace and all those wonderful things that we want out of life, all the while recognizing that time after time they disappoint. And what ends up happening is that the idols we serve start enslaving us. You really see that with possessions. It's really struck me over my life as I've bought and owned different things, and, and you've heard some of the stories, so I don't even have to go into the details about it. But the things that we buy that we think will give us joy end up in the end what? Owning us. The things that we want to own end up owning us, and they end up controlling our time and our money and our resources. And eventually what happens is we go down this path long enough, and they've got us enslaved. And, and we can get ourselves into some real difficult places. Some of you have been in those places. Some of them, you are in those places. But I'm hoping that those of you who are going towards those places might stop. So, Timothy Keller said it this way, if you want to live for money instead of for me, then money will rule your life, says the Lord. It will control your heart and emotions. If you want to live for popularity instead of for me, then popular acclaim will rule and control you. If you want another God besides me, God says, go ahead. Let's see how merciful it is to you, how effective it is in saving, guiding, and enlightening you. So, the Israelites repent. They say, we are sorry. We will no longer follow these gods. Then we get into our story and our judge. Now, I'm going to give you something really fancy, and then I'm not going to use it. Are you ready? So, the name of the ruler that we're reading about today is this. Uh, it's, it, in our English text, it looks like Jephthah. Right? In the Hebrew text, this is how you say it. I have to remember, yiftka, yiftka. Now, I'm not going to use that, but we're all going to learn a little bit of Hebrew this morning, okay? So say on the, with me, yiftka, yiftka. All right, so when the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, Whoever will take the lead in attacking the Ammonites will be head over all who live in Gilead. Again, recognize that we've broken now out of that cycle. It's not that God has come to Jephthah and said, you will lead my people. The people are now saying, who's going to lead us? And they can't even find a leader. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were growing up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance of our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his gang, his brothers, and settled in the land of Tob, 
where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. That's our introduction to our character. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? Now, stop here for a moment. There's an interesting mirroring of what happened in the earlier chapter. In the earlier chapter, the Israelites came to God and they said, we're sorry, will you, will you deliver us? And God says, no, you're not really sorry. You're just regretful. And then they come again and they say, yes, we want you to lead us. And in this text, the Gileadites are coming. And, and you got the context already, right? Here's Jephthah. He's the son of a prostitute, so he's only a half-brother. And his full brothers come before him, and they, and they get rid of him. They kick him out of the house. And he's left on his own. And so what does he do? He goes out, and basically he becomes a mob boss. Right? The scoundrels gathered together around him and followed him. So he becomes a, a leader of an organized group of criminals. That the way they survive is because they have no inheritance, they have no land, they have no rights. They steal from others. And so now these, these, these sons of Gilead, the Gileadites, they come to him and they say, we need you to lead us. And he says, no, you don't really want me to lead you. You just, you just want me to rescue you and you're just going to discard me. And they say, no. Suppose we take you back to Jephthah to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people and made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all those words before the Lord in Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, what do you have against me that you have attacked me and my country? So again, to look at this character, this is someone who's had a very difficult life. I want us to understand that because I think it colors a lot of his reality. The fact that he was illegitimate. The fact that he was cut off from his family inheritance. The fact that he was sent away. All these trauma, traumas came into his life. And so, does that make for a good leader? That would be my question. It can it can when someone has gone through the process of healing and restoration. And, and so here is this character who the Gileadites see as the only one able to lead them. And what he ends up doing is that he sends this letter and he says, give us back our land and leave us alone. Here's why our claim is a rightful claim. And then in verse 28, the king of Ammon, however, paid no attention and sent this attention to the message Jephthah sent to him. Then we read about the battle. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. Now, this is going to get a little messy here, okay? We're going to get a little messy here. And maybe you've read this story before and you're going, oh, yeah, this isn't, isn't this the story where the guy makes the vow? Boat thing coming out of his house, and it ends up really messy. It, it really does. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aurora to the vicinity of Meneth, as far as Abel Kerarimim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. 
When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you have promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. That's a pretty terrible story, isn't it? Isn't that a terrible story? Uh, and how might we be able to make sense of this story? And sometimes I think we, need a, we have to build a filter, especially when we're reading through the Old Testament, to understand when people are following God's way and when they are not. And the confusing thing about this story is that we would think that Jephthah, as a judge, as a leader of the Israelites, would be following God's will. And so when we read this, we think, how would God ever accept that kind of a sacrifice? Because it clearly says within the book of Deuteronomy that God does not desire those kind of sacrifices. In fact, he detests it. So what's going on? You see, we so readily want to play, blame, lay the blame on God for this story, don't we? But what if our lead character is so flawed and so compromised by the culture around him and the gods that he's been serving for so many years that he's unable to distinguish what worship of the true God looks like. Are you following me? You see, here's the reality. Jephthah has been serving all these other gods. And these other gods had before them as part of their sacrifices, child sacrifice. And so Jephthah assumes that God would desire such a sacrifice. He desires that the vow that he's making, that he would sacrifice the first thing coming out of his house, would actually please God when it wouldn't at all. And so the reality is, is that while he makes this commitment, he's been desensitized to who God is and what God is about by the culture around him. Let me say that again. He has been desensitized to who God is and what God is about by the culture around him. So when you hear that, are you able to step back and to say, is there a way that maybe I've been desensitized to who God is and what God is about by the culture around me? Is that a possibility? And it goes back to that question that I asked you at the beginning. Do you struggle with wondering if you're really following God or whether you've compromised too much and tricked yourself? So, Jephthah is compromised by his culture. Second, he's infected by pagan moral codes. By this pagan moral works righteousness that has worked its way into all the other religions that says, if God does something for me, then I got to do something for him. And we fight and wrestle, and we experience that. And the third part is, why didn't Jephthah, why did he then keep his vow? Right? In this situation, why did Jephthah keep his vow? Well, here's what the story doesn't tell us. And I wish it was written in there. Because I think it was part of the heart of God. And, and, and I wish what it said is that somebody had come to Jephthah at that time and said, Jephthah, what you don't understand is God doesn't desire your human sacrifice. God desires that you serve him above all and with none other. But he does not desire this. And Jephthah says, I can't break my vow. But the reality is, is that with God, 
We break our vow all the time. And so to come before him at that point to, to say, God, I understand. I wish someone's just told me that this isn't how you desire for me to worship you. You don't desire that I sacrifice my daughter to you. But the problem is, is that Jephthah doesn't understand that God is a God of grace. He still thinks that God is a God of transactional love. He thinks that God is like the other gods where if we make a vow or we do something, we have to, you know, on our own, be obedient and serve and love and honor and whatever it is that we have to do in order to honor God rather than God being a God of grace who freely gives to us his love. So what about us? For ourselves, well, I want to draw out two applications for us this morning. First is this, every single one of us has enormous blind spots. The reason I drew attention to the background of Jephthah is this, he was from a broken reality. He didn't grow up in the way God would have desired for him to grow up. And so there was lots of pieces in his life that though we can't fully understand or know, we have enough information to know that he had a difficult life. When I think back to the reality that many of you, especially of our older members, grew up in a time of war. You grew up in a situation in an environment that was incredibly difficult. And the wounds and the ideas that came through that process and as a part of your reality of living in that place affected who you are and what you understand about God and about life. And there are some very rich lessons that came from that place, but as with all of us, there could be some lies that came. There could be lies that came from us from a variety of other areas in our own life. I was speaking with someone recently who, in just understanding their own childhood, was saying that there were things that happened and, and that, that, that wounds came into their lives. And there are things that start to happen in those points that impact how we live out the rest of our lives. Whether it's having a hard time accepting ourselves, whether it's having a hard time understanding and appreciating who God created us to be because others, you know, said negative things about that. And, and I understand and appreciate that, you know, we don't want to be a place of psychology, but we are a place of brokenness. And part of our brokenness means understanding those wounds. So here's my point. I want to invite you, no matter what your age is, to take some time over this next week to say, are there some lies that are built into my life that I may need to go back and fix? There's a beautiful process about uh, inner healing and that counselors can lead you on, and I've been through it myself, okay? One of the reasons I could sit up here and talk about it is because I've been through it myself a couple of different times with a couple of different issues. So it's a reality that there's brokenness in our lives. And I'm so grateful that as a church, we're part of a counseling program where people can go and they can get six sessions at no charge to work through and understand these issues. I'm right now envisioning Cap calling me and saying, why is everybody in your church calling us and coming for counseling? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Because what we can all do, people of God, is dig into our own lives, unpack where have we maybe bought into a lie, where has culture impacted, where have the circumstances or the uh, compromises in our life impacted us in such a way that we might not even be seeing it. Because here's the reality. When you take the time to dig into those things and unpack them, there's freedom and joy and there's healing that comes. Mm -hmm. So, don't resist if the Spirit is prompting you that this is something maybe you should spend some time. 
A counseling program is in our, on our website. It's on uh, programs and in our newsletter. Uh, it's as simple as just calling them, saying you're a member of Rehoboth and you'd like to have a session. And go for one or two sessions. See what starts happening. Second thing I want to talk about is that we often struggle to see God as a God of grace. Just as Jephthah thought that God needed to be treated like all the other gods, that God wouldn't just rescue him and set him free for no cost, we think and feel oftentimes having a hard time accepting that grace. And it's interesting to me as I reflect upon this story. Jephthah thought it would take the sacrifice of a child to put him in right relationship with God. Does that resonate with anything else in the scripture? If you've been coming to church, maybe you're starting to recognize that there was a sacrifice of a child that was made. It's interesting that we have the story of Abraham and Isaac, and now we have this story of Jephthah and his daughter. And we also have the story of the fact that God himself sent his son, again, his one, his only son, because that was the way that we could be put in a right relationship with God. Jephthah sacrificing his, saw, his daughter did nothing for reconciling his relationship with God. But God sending his son made it possible for every single one of us to reckon, be reconciled. And if you struggle with that or you're not understanding or you're not grasping that, maybe you got it a little bit in your mind but not fully in your heart, then come on Tuesday. Just one, just come this Tuesday night, 6.30, be here, over there, and be ready. Be ready for God to transform your life, to make that truth a reality within your life. So, to bring it back, I'm not even doing bad for time. Bring it back to that first question. Do you ever struggle with wondering whether you are really following God or whether you've compromised too much and tricked yourself? Well, it's, it's addressed in Romans. Listen to this. These things happened to them as examples, and they were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So... Here's the indicator, right? So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can endure. Here's what this is saying. If you think you're all good, if your answer to that question about whether you think that, you know, you've compromised too much, uh, if you're really following God or whether you've compromised too much, if your answer to that question is like, no, I'm all good. I'm all good. I got no problem with that. You're in trouble. That's what Romans is saying. Saying if you think you are on good, solid standing because of your own behavior, then you better watch out because you're going to fall. And maybe the Lord will bring you down. But here's the beauty of it, people of God. Do you continue to struggle with it? Do you continue to struggle with sin? Do you continue to, to struggle against the culture and the values and, and the, that little area that sometimes feels like Satan has a stronghold in your life, yet you know that God's grace covers you? If that's your truth, then welcome to the game. Because that's all of us. We all continue to struggle. And that's how we can know and understand that we're not giving in to the world or the culture or the compromise because we continue to wrestle against that and to say, God, strengthen me, help me, release me. And you know what? Sometimes God does. So we get amazing testimonies and stories of lives that are transformed. But the reality is that every single one of us will continue to struggle, just as the Israelites struggled, continue in that cycle of understanding and saying, here's an idol that we want to hold on to, and yet we know that we should only be holding on to God. 
And so, people of God, we continue by the grace of God to follow him. And he continues to remind us through preachers, leaders, teachers, friends, family members, that his glory is what we should be holding on to. His glory is what we should be living for. Let's pray. Lord, I give you thanks that we are not so far gone that we have forsaken you. That we have said, forget God. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. The mere fact that we are sitting here this morning or that we are listening to this is a clear indication that our heart's desire is to serve and to honor you. And in our spirit, Lord, we are strong, but we recognize that it is an ongoing battle. So, Lord, if there's anyone here who thinks that they are standing firm on their own accord, may you knock them down. It is not about what we do or what we have done, but it is about your grace and your son. And, Lord, it breaks our heart to hear this story of a daughter sacrificed because of a wrong understanding of your grace and a wrong understanding of your mercy and your love. And yet, Lord, we recognize that those things are happening today. Lives are being lost. Lives are being sacrificed because we have not fully understood your truth or your grace. And so, Lord, I pray as a congregation that we would continue to work through whatever barriers there are in our lives to fully embrace and receive and live within your grace and your truth. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder that it is not about our behavior, but it is about your son's sacrifice. And so, Lord, you have promised to us also the beautiful gift of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit that will lead us and guide us, strengthen us. And so, Lord, help us to stand. Help us, as those Israelites did, to throw away whatever idols may remain in our lives so that there is nothing to distract us from following you, fully devoted. Amen. Praise team is coming back up. The song of response is, Whom shall I fear? You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, I cannot hide the light. Whom shall we fear? No one but the Lord. Let's stand and sing that together.
while ago I was reading the book of Matthew where Jesus is tempted by Satan. It says, after he went through all those temptations and the angels came and they ministered to him. And that kind of struck me because I thought, here's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and yet he needed to be ministered to. Our pride can be so, so strong. And yet God invites us in humility to to look at ourselves and to trust him, to say, you know what? You can work through this brokenness. You can break through this barrier. And so while they were mentioned just passing by as applications, I again want to reiterate, many of you would change the spiritual trajectory of your life were you to break down that barrier of pride and to say, I'm going to go for counseling. I'm going to dig in and understand why I am this way. Or you would say, you know what? I, I realize I'm spiritually dry. And again, God is, is inviting me. And, and though it may be hard to show up, I'm going to come on Tuesday night. I'm just going to come. The one night, I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to see if that truly is the place where God needs me to be again. Because it can change the spiritual trajectory of my life. And here's the reality, people of God. Unless the spiritual trajectory of our life is like this, the spiritual trajectory of our community will not match it. Amen? Amen? All right. So God, fill us with your strength and your courage. Help us not to see ourselves through our own eyes because we are filled with brokenness and compromise. But help us to see ourselves with the eyes of Jesus Christ that always shine with compassion, with love, and with grace. And so, Lord, send us forward as the salt and light of this community. Amen. Thank you.